It is time to talk Miami football. We've got Cam Underwood from the State of the U on the line with uh, the Canes' big game against Coastal Division rival Virginia Tech coming up Saturday night. Prime time, ABC, 8 o'clock Eastern time. That's when you know it's serious stuff. Cam, how are you doing tonight? I'm good. I feel good. I feel strong. You know, uh, just getting ramped up for this game. You know, there's been some light trash talk on Twitter and Facebook, things like that. You always – like to hear the fans chirping. I mean, it's not about the players, you know, talking. Like Their talk is going to be, you know, running and, you know, hitting and catching footballs and things like that on the field. But, yeah, you know, I like – I like this man, you know, I, I like, uh, I like this whole thing. I love, I'm, I'm enjoying this process, you know, and uh, I know we're going to talk about a bunch of things, but it's been a while since we've had a game of this kind of consequence for the university of Miami. The whole time that you and I have been doing these videos, it's been, okay, we lost in Cincinnati. We did this. This is a different year and I'm enjoying this. So yeah, you know, I feel good. I'm excited for this week's game. Uh, and I was joking with you before, uh, we got on talking about, oh, do we have a game this week? Yeah, we have a huge game this week. And I love that kind of stuff. So I'm in good spirits. You know, I feel good. Uh, hopefully this team does as well. And I'm excited. Yeah, exactly right. So I think I first tracked you down sometime around 2013, maybe during that season. That's my guess. I'd have to go back and look at the videos. And pretty much since through the end of last season, even though I finished off well, it wasn't about winning championships. It was about Al Golden, is he the right guy? He doesn't appear to be the right. He's not the right guy. <laughs> and now it's settled and we know that. Okay, let's move on. We know we've got all this South Florida talent right in our backyard. We've recruited most of it, but nobody's developing it. What do we do? It's it was it's been about building a program. It's been about the disappointments and what should be and what has been in the past and when is it going to be this again? And okay, Mark Rick, name coach. Okay, when is he going to deliver? So it's been a lot of what ifs and disappointments, but now we've got a game that uh, is of Miami standard. Uh, so we'll get to it in just a second. We also have a ranking that's close to Miami standards of the past. It's a top 10 label. This not uh, from the uh, Associated Press or the coaches poll, but this one actually counts or could for Miami in particular and other teams as we head toward the stretch of the season because these are the people that actually decide who goes where and the top four that really count. So Miami comes out at number 10 in the nation with a 7-0 and record according to the College Football Playoff Committee. Your thoughts about the ranking where it stands? We know that they need to win regardless of where they sit now, but do you think it's a fair placement for this team? I think it's a little low, honestly. Um, <clears throat> there's five undefeated teams in Division One. There's four undefeated teams in the Power Five conferences, those being Georgia, Alabama, Wisconsin and Miami. Uh, I'm not saying that those need to be the top four at current, but 10th just seems low, honestly. Um, you know, and they were talking about Notre Dame's phenomenal loss to Georgia and everything. It boggles my mind that we're not using wins and losses as a metric for success. And all of the narrative stuff about strength of schedule and game control and whatnot there's a couple people uh, who were tweeting out some counterfactuals to what was presented by Kirby Hocutt, who is formerly the University of Miami athletic director, of whom I do not have any fond memories uh, at all. But, you know, you're talking about strength of schedule. Well, Alabama's strength of schedule is lower than Miami's. Well, Miami doesn't have any top 25 wins. Alabama has one. Florida State. But, you know, and, you know, they're talking about, well, you know, they play Florida State at full, full speed, which tacitly derides Miami's win over Florida State. But had things been reversed, it would be a different kind of thing. So it's just if you're being honest about it and just say, look, Miami has not been as strong of a team as we thought. That's why we put them at 10. I can take the truth. I just hate this duplicitous nature of what is actually being said, which runs counterfactual to, you know, what the truth of the situation is. but. You know, that's just how I feel about it. I'm not going to get really bent out of shape. Coaches have us at six. AP has us at nine. Uh, I thought that the playoff would have us at about eight or nine. Uh, so one spot below that, not terribly uh, bad or anything like that. And as we're going to talk about, as long as Miami wins games, they're in the driver's seat of our own destiny. You know, the Hurricanes are 10th, but you have two big games this week and then next week. And then obviously games after that, which we expect to win. 
just because the teams after uh, the next two weeks are not as strong as the two teams that we're playing back-to-back -back right here. But, you know, I think that it is a little low, but I think all things can be rectified with wins, and all we've done for the last 12 game weeks is win. So I'm hopeful uh, and looking forward to Miami continuing that this week. Cam, you forgot to cite the Mark Rogers TV poll of one where Miami is ranked <laughs> number seven. <laughs> Oh, I didn't even know that. I'll take that. So, okay, cool. So we got six, seven, nine, and ten. So all, all there somewhere, and, you know, hopefully we keep winning. All those numbers are going to go uh, closer to one. You can imagine, and you already know this, but I guess I'm, I'm telling some people out there, when you do something like I do on a nearly daily basis, you obviously love the debate, love the discussion, and love to analyze. Uh, so this is something that I've found myself doing each and every Sunday is look at the top 25 and tear it to shreds and point out the inconsistencies and the illogic to it. And then I produce my own top 25. So you've got your bucket of people that go eyeball test. Then you've got your bucket of people over here that go track record and resume. And I'm in the track record and resume category. We keep hearing, for example, taking it away from Miami for just a minute, Ohio State lost to Oklahoma. They lost decidedly to Oklahoma by two scores uh, in the second half. Therefore, for me, as long as those two teams continue to perform, meaning the results on the field are the same, and to date they are at 7-1, and one, Oklahoma should be ranked ahead of Ohio State. Uh, for some reason, people think, okay, Ohio State, they're much better. That was an aberration. If they played again, they beat them by three touchdowns. And that might be the case, but we don't know that. That's total conjecture. That's not the truth. That's not reality. The reality is the two teams played. Just like they played last year, and Oklahoma finished number five, and Ohio State finished number six with the same record, even though Ohio State won on the field. It's funny that, that the opposite is happening this year because of people's perception. They just believe that whatever they think is really – should trump actually what happened on the field. And it's it's insane to me uh, when we have clear evidence on the field of what happened and we can't rank the, the teams accordingly. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. And, you know, obviously the head-to-head -head is a huge thing. If you go back to the year 2000, my freshman year at Miami, um, we beat Florida State, and Florida yep. State went to the national championship game and got shut out by Oklahoma, uh, and Miami did not go to the national championship game that year, even though head-to-head. -head. You know, so these things, I know it's a, a current thing in that situation with Oklahoma and O-State, but uh, this thing's been going on, you know, for a long time. But uh, spinning it back to Miami, in that the Hurricanes are undefeated, there can be no controversion at, the, at current time. So if we continue, if the Hurricanes have continued to win, there is not a – but, okay, well, you know, da, da, da. I get that the optics might not be the greatest. I know that we played arguably our worst game of the year against a terrible North Carolina team last week and barely snuck out with the win. But at the end of the day, we won that game. We won the Syracuse game, the Clems or the Georgia Tech game, the Florida State game, uh, and every other game that's on our schedule. So, you know, as long as those things happen, then I think that, you know, Miami is going to continue to go up. But – uh, yeah, there are in other areas of the poll, you know, that head to head kind of thing. If one team beats a team and then that team loses to another team, where should they be ranked? So, you know, that, that's always going to happen. It's the nature of sports. And I mean, you have 130 teams in Division One college football now, and you're lucky to get one or two of them that go undefeated in any season. So uh, there's always going to be, you know, talk and conjecture, but hopefully Miami can silence all that with some wins. Yeah, to me, the results on the field should trump everything else. Then the performance on the field should be a tiebreaker, meaning if you were comparing Miami to somebody else and Miami beat North Carolina 17 to 12 or whatever the score was, I watched it start to 24-19, 24-16, yeah. whatever it was, uh, they beat North Carolina and you were comparing them directly to somebody else. And the only game you had to compare them directly, and they were both, let's say, 8-0 and was another team that beat North Carolina 52 to nothing. Okay, fine. We can make that comparison. Uh, but otherwise, results first, meaning the score on the scoreboard and the wins and losses, then performance. Because if you win every game by one point, that shouldn't go against you. We're not sitting around debating NFL standings because teams won games by one point. The wins and the losses should be first and foremost. Then the performance and the the tracking of the, the wins and losses versus the schedule. Certainly schedule, strength of schedule is extremely important as well. The tricky part, 
not to continue the conjecture, but it is fun, is let's say a loss to Notre Dame by Miami running the table in the ACC, winning the ACC championship game, I would still consider any ACC champion with one loss to be worthy of the college football playoff, but it might be a little dicey in that situation. Yeah, I mean, those, those, all those things I believe, you know, are, are correct. But we just got to keep winning games for Miami and everything is going to, you know, go in a good direction. Sorry, I got a little distracted, saw some recruiting news. So uh, my mind was a little split there. But, uh, yeah, I think that you're on the right path. Well, Cam, anytime you've got recruiting news for you, if it's anything substantial and anything that's been substantiated, you can certainly share it with us. Well, I mean, yeah, as I'm, I'm tweeting this out now, but uh, Miami's quarterback commit, Arthur Sikowski, just flipped uh, to Ruggers. So that's his uh, hometown uh, team. He's from New Jersey. He transferred to IMG Academy uh, for this school year, um, was looking to upgrade his uh, performance and things like that, played pretty poorly actually a couple of times and got benched for another kid who's not really even a big time recruit, uh, Zach Anikstad is his, is his name. Uh, yeah. And Miami was going to stick with Sikowski even through the poor performance. Uh, he had like, three for 12 for two interceptions and like 13 yards against Miami Central earlier in the season. Miami Central being one of the best high school teams in America. Uh, I'm just seeing, like, I, my phone was going crazy. I have it on silent, but it's lighting up over here. And so I was like, okay, let me go back over to my tweet deck on my laptop and see what's going on. And just, wow. So uh, that that's uh, that's something new. So uh, Miami is looking for a quarterback commit in this class again. And, uh, yeah, you know, recruited. we haven't talked recruiting in a while because it's been a, a different kind of recruiting year for Miami. Miami basically got settled with the 2018 class with the large foundation of it. And then uh, it's just kind of selecting to rec uh, finish out the class. Uh, but, yeah, you know, I believe that you have to have a quarterback in every class just because of attrition and injury and performance and you just have to have one for your, your program. And uh, Sikowski might not have been the best performer on the field this year, but uh, he's young for his grade, which is a, a, the first thing. Uh, just turned 17 last spring, so he's going to turn 18 in the spring of 2018. Excuse me. So you have a lot of kids who are 18 and a half, 19 coming in as freshmen. He's young for his grade or at the grade age level for those of us who are a little bit older, like you or I. Uh, that's what the normal grade age was. Um, you know, he's 6'5", 218, has a strong arm, good fundamentals. Obviously needs to improve his performance, but uh, he's going to be trying to improve that back home in New Jersey and not down in Coral Gables, which... Uh, yeah, I was, and I was just seeing a bunch of stuff. A couple of my friends are texting me like, hey, we just offered this guy a quarterback and that guy. And I'm like, why would we do that? And I saw some people, you know, trying to find what my screen name is on Twitter. Underwood Sports is mine. And then at the State of the U is the site. Uh, so you can find me in either of those places. So I'm wondering why I'm getting all these mentions. So, yeah, uh, Miami's quarterback for the 2018 class just flipped to Rutgers. So uh, you heard it here live on the recording. So that's fun. Kim, I'm just glad to be uh, grouped in your age classification. That, that you did that for me. Just just <laughs> putting the same age classification. I like that. So yeah, Sikowski. Yeah, man, I, mean, <laughs> look, I mean, we're not uh, we're not spring chickens either anymore, either of us. So uh, yeah, the uh, the way in the rear view mirror for high school kind of age group. Yeah, that's fine. So I see that uh, Sikowski is pretty well regarded as the 11th rated pro style quarterback in the composite from 247. Actually, 247 Sports uh, specifically has him rated as the fifth best pro style quarterback number 42 recruit out of new jersey and a top 300 player overall at 65 215 yeah all right I mean, he's, he's well regarded I, I guarantee you that's going to change just because his performance at img was was not good and we spoke about him playing in a wing t kind of offense in high school uh back in old bridge new jersey and looking to really go to a more pro style or spread set uh down there at img Shane Patterson, or sorry, Shea Patterson from Ole Miss was there previously. Kellen Mond, who's starting at Texas A&M, two starting quarterbacks uh, in the SEC right now. Uh, there's a couple other guys who went through IMG, so he's trying to follow those footsteps. And, uh, you know, while I believe he's developing, uh, it's kind of the – like if you're doing a home reno and you do wiring and, and plumbing and it's stuff inside the walls that you can't readily see, I think that's how his development is going. So I think you're going to see it further down the line. But you're not going to see it in orange and green. You're going to see it in whatever colors Rutgers wears because who knows. But, uh, you know, yeah, that, that uh, interesting stuff. So when I get off of here, I'm definitely going to have to work on that. But, uh, yeah, so recruiting, it, it, it never stops. And I talk about this all the time. But, uh, yeah. 
All right, we're talking Miami Hurricanes football with Cam Underwood from State of the U. Please join him there for the very best in Miami football coverage with the Canes taking on Virginia Tech this week. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel for college football coverage coast-to-coast, -coast, uh, conversations with the likes of Cam and other bloggers and broadcasters, uh, the audio version in its complete form on Stitcher, Podbean, and iTunes. So, Cam, uh, give us your rundown of the North Carolina performance in terms of what matters from that performance. So noon Eastern time, Chapel Hill, maybe a little bit of a sleepy uh, start for the Canes. Maybe a lot of that performance was lost in some of the bigger games preceding, followed by this big game coming up and all of that. But what do you think really sticks from that performance that, that makes sense, both good and bad, that projects forward to Virginia Tech this week? Good were chunk plays on offense. Um, and that's really what saved Miami. Uh, when the Canes had a shot to hit a home run ball, they did it. Uh, that touchdown to Jeff Thomas when he undressed the cornerback on the first play of the third quarter, yeah, right when we got came out of halftime, double move, put the hand up like Randy Moss, he's wide open, boom, hit that one, hit a couple other ones. Uh, the Chris Herndon uh, seam route where he spun away from three guys and he goes 51 yards for a score. Um, all the chunk plays were great. I think that that was awesome. The, uh, you know, when you had success, you know, based on success rates, getting your requisite number of yards. So uh, given the situation, uh, it was very few times that, that happened. But when it did, Miami was really, really efficient. When they, it wasn't like average efficiency. It was like outstanding efficiency. Like, you know, 50 yards, 70 yards, 20 yards when you needed eight. Like, I mean, there when you hit plays, you hit plays. Uh, so that was a good thing. The bad side of that is it was very few plays, and a lot of the other plays were garbage. Um, Miami's run game was pathetic, honestly. Um, Thomas Brown, the offensive coordinator and running backs coach, said it was a terrible performance on offense. Uh, it was, yeah, just terrible to see, and I agree with that. So – kind of balance those things out uh on the positive side for defense about five turnovers that's awesome i love stuff like that give me the ball back on the negative side we needed all of those turnovers and the associated point luck because every turnover is like 4.5 points like negated from the potential score from the other team if you're looking at advanced statistics so we won by what five and got 13 points 14 points of turnover luck Without those turnovers, that's probably a loss. Um, so that's a negative there. Um, and then just not being ah, – it, it was just an uneven performance. I mean, you just had to have players making spectacular plays because the normal plays weren't being made. R.J. McIntosh is a beast. He's pretty much unblockable. He was ACC Defensive Lineman of the Week. He had nine tackles in the first half, ended with like 11, a tackle and a half for a loss. Sack and a half, two pass breakups, which gives him not, uh, seven pass breakups in the last two weeks because he's getting his hands on all kinds of passes because the interior linemen can't block him for the last two teams, you know, from Syracuse and uh, North Carolina. But without him, man, you know, some of those other sacks that people got or were able to run into, they happen because R.J. McIntosh is getting up the middle of the field. What happens if he doesn't have a superstar game? He just has a good game or an average game. You know, then maybe Joe Jackson's not able to get to that other sack, and maybe Michael Pinckney and maybe Shaq Quarterman, they're maybe a step slower, and that quarterback has an extra split second, and, you know, things go a different way. So uh, it, it was just really – it left a lot to be desired on pretty much all fronts. Um, there were a couple good kick returns by Jeff Thomas. There were a couple bad ones. There was one he got tackled on, like, the 9 or 11-yard line. There was one or two good punts from Zach Fiegels, but there were, like, four or five bad punts. Um, so even – in all three areas, offense, defense, and special teams, no matter what I say as a positive, there's a contrary negative, um, which was almost enough to get us to lose that game, except for the highs on offense were so high that it was unrecoverable for North Carolina. Um, and with the highs on offense and defense, you know, you get those takeaways, so we get the ball back. You know, you blow a coverage against Chris Herndon and against Jeff Thomas, strike up the band and play the fight song. You know, and I love those things. And Michael Badgley is automatic at a kicker. Uh, we were talking about special teams on Twitter today. People were, you know, bringing up different things. I said, I love the fact that he's so automatic, Michael Badgley is our kicker, that we don't even mention him anymore as a thing. It's just, he's going to make field goals. Like, yeah, okay, missed from like 53 or something because it fell short for that. Anything inside 45, automatic. So I love that. But 
I mean, yeah, there were some positives, but the overwhelming majority were negatives. Um, yeah, just just a lot to be desired. Not not really executing in the run game. Had like two point three yards per carry. Uh, you know, the uh, completion percentage wasn't great uh, either. Had some more drop balls by Amon Richards and other guys too. Just yeah, it's just it was just it, yeah. it almost. I don't know, like if you you make copy, and if you saw the movie Insomnia with Al Pacino, um, he's in Alaska and he's a, a a cop and he can't sleep because it's during the six months of sun. And I've had insomnia before, and it's crazy because life becomes a copy of a copy of a copy, and it just gets more blurry, you know. And I think that's how our performance was. There was no like clear lines of this was really good and this was really bad, but there was just a lot of meh and the meh in the middle started trending towards bad so uh we just really need to clean up that performance it's you know and if you got 11 guys on the field for 92 plays because again another team tried to go tempo and have the most plays that they've had in a game this year because people think that tempo is the way to beat miami i don't know if it is or not but i know that the teams that have run tempo have been unsuccessful being toledo being duke being syracuse and now being north carolina all having run 85 or more plays and all having lost because everybody who's played miami's lost but it just uh, if you have 11 guys out there for 90 plays you're talking almost a thousand assignments to give or, give or take you know with penalties and some other things so even if you only have a 10 percent fail rate that's a hundred missed assignments or missed gaps or something that those numbers can cost you a ball game, and I think maybe that's part of the problem. But yeah, the highs were highs, and the lows were really low, and we need to get them cleaned up. That's my takeaway from North Carolina. Came Underwood, State of the U, breaking down uh, the Canes as they head toward a date with Virginia Tech for the Coastal Division lead in the ACC. Cam, what you mentioned about the running games, what was running through my mind in the second half is this continued to be a, a, a close game, even with the Thomas touchdown coming out of the locker room. And that's when you typically see uh, a superior football team taking on a team that's hanging around, keeping it close, playing above its head, and especially with the injuries that North Carolina has on uh, both sides of the ball, that at some point in the game, especially with a Mark Richt team, and as much as he loves to impose his will and establish the run, at some point they come out one drive and say, okay, let's slow down the game, and we're going to run the ball down your throats. We are going to impose our will. We're coming after you, and this drive is going to be all about physical football, and that never happened. It's not for lack of trying. Um, I just don't think that Miami's there on the offensive line. And you see that. Navon Donaldson, the freshman, uh, former high school All-American, uh, was injured with the ankle uh, that he hurt a couple weeks ago, sat out the Syracuse game, played only like two or three snaps last week and wasn't able to go. And his replacement, Hayden Mahoney, um, just playing got beat a lot, a lot. Uh, it was to the point where having talked, or, or I saw some people, on Twitter saying that they thought North Carolina was stealing plays because that's how quickly Mahoney got beaten to the punch. Like if you're trying zone, you know, and you're slanting and they're past you before you even take your step, you know, things like that. And I, I don't know if they were or not. Either way, Miami won. Uh, I know that Larry Fedora has talked about it being the incumbent responsibility on the opposing team to hide their signals, not him not to look at the signals, uh, which makes me believe that maybe there's some truth to that. I don't know. You debate amongst yourselves. Um, but, yeah, the offensive line just was getting whooped all day, um, and that's been a thing. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we Miami tried to run the ball. They tried to sit on it and say, okay, we're going to run that buck sweep play that I talked about earlier with Travis Homer uh, being his bread and butter play. And tried that a couple times. Nope, not working. Inside zone. Nope, not run, not working. Uh, zone read. They figured out every time they're going to run zone read, the quarterback or the running the defensive end, excuse me, was going to sit and make the quarterback give the ball. A la when Brad Kyle was here, we ran zone read, but he gave it to the running back all the time, and then everybody just crashed, probably through Mahoney's uh, gap and to the middle, and then, you know, they're going nowhere. So uh, I think Mark Rick's team want, or Mark Rick's offense wants to run the ball. But like we saw with Syracuse, I think that he knows that passing the ball is where the advantage is for this team. We have a lot of playmakers on the outside. You know, you put Christopher Herndon in the slot um, and then let him go. He has the most yards out of the slot out of any tight end in the ACC this year, I want to say. Um, 
Amon Richards on the outside when he's healthy. Jeff Thomas now on the outside. Brackus Barrios uh, on the inside as well. Dante Mullins rotating in. Uh, Daryl Langham, who's sitting now, even though, you know, the hero of those two games. But he plays the same position as Amon Richards. Excuse me. I would try to maybe get him to move from the X to the Z so you can play Richards and Langham at the same time. But, you know, hey, even if they're still rotating, that's still a guy with who's made plays at a receiver position. And I've named all those guys. I haven't named Deontay Mullins. I've not named uh, Dale Harris, who's made plays. Lawrence Cager, uh, coming back off of a knee injury, having a not great season, but he still has athletic potential. Miami's receivers are the weaponry now. So I think it's a tribute to Mark Richt in that he's kind of figured out, look, the run game is not going. And for whatever reason, whether it's execution or other teams just cheating the run or just selling out against the run and saying, we're going to make them throw. But Miami's offense is really trending towards passing. Um, and I think that that's more out of necessity than desire. But even if you look back to the Syracuse game, that last drive, Mark Rick said, we're going up tempo and everybody's screaming, you know, hey, run the ball, go conservative tempo, you know, snap it with two seconds on the play clock or something. And Mark Rick said, look, their guys were tired. Our guys were fresh. And we're going to go up tempo. We're going to score a touchdown, which is what happened. So, uh, like I said, I think it's out of necessity, not desire. Uh, but eventually we're going to see Miami hopefully get back to that power run game. I just don't think that this week or this season is really going to be when that happens. Even though Amon Richards might be close to 100% physically, do you think he's still trying to get back into the groove, into the flow, because he just doesn't seem himself? He had an off game. He dropped a couple balls, just didn't look like he was at the top of his game. Yeah, I think uh, there there has to be something mental going on with him. He has six drops in the last two weeks, only has 14 catches in the four games he's played because he sat out three games because of his hamstring injury. Um, and even in the game against Syracuse, when he dropped four passes, he's still at six catches for 99 yards. So even in the midst of not awesome performance from him, Amon Rich is still an elite player. Uh, but, yeah, I do think that he is trying to find his sea legs, trying to get back into the flow of the game and have everything slow down for him and like make it be a little bit easier like it was before. Because when you see everything click, he's still an elite player. He's still an amazing wide receiver. He's still, you know, top 10, top five in America. Uh, but, yeah, I think he's being a little rusty. I think he's trying to get 100% back uh, all the way uh, in sync and on time with everybody on offense. But I think that, you know, as he continues to play more snaps uh, as the season goes, I think that he'll be back to his old self. Uh, you know, and approach uh, some comparable numbers on ratio, if not the raw number, because he's missed a couple of games. It's a huge game in the ACC with Virginia Tech at 7-1, and one, the lone loss to Clemson going to Miami to take on the Canes. This uh, uh, pretty historic rivalry, maybe not of the ilk of a few of the ones that we know of and Miami uh, involvement with Florida State in particular. But uh, going back to the Big East days, a lot of meaningful games. This is the first between ranked Hokie and Kane teams since 2010. Uh, but during that span between the mid-90s and that 2010 season, they were meeting on a regular basis as highly, highly ranked teams. And they've got uh, a big uh, <laughs> big prize in front of both teams at the Coastal Division Championship, most likely that nobody else is going to factor into it. It's pretty much down to these two schools as we head toward Saturday night. Don't know if you've had a chance um, to see much of Virginia Tech or or talk to their folks, uh, Cam, but uh, I saw the Clemson game for the most part, saw West Virginia for the most part. Those are the two Virginia Tech games, really the only two games of significance that they've played. And um, with the two defenses that we're going to see on Saturday night, uh, there may not be a whole lot of scoring. Yeah, I think it's going to be a dogfight. You know, I think that George, our Virginia Tech, excuse me, they've had one of the best defenses in America over the last 25 years. You know, Bud Foster's been there, and they play their starters a lot on defense and special teams, and they execute really well. Uh, Trey Edmonds, I know, uh, had a huge week for them last week. Uh, you know, he's always been there making plays. you got Tim Settle, a defensive tackle, who I swore has been there for 17 years, but he's only a redshirt sophomore and he's making plays. you got defensive backs all the time. and But Foster's going to scheme you up now. So I hope that Mark Richt on offense has some wrinkles because if they're only going to do what has been put on film, you know, Virginia Tech's defense is tough. And I know, I mean, Miami's defense is as well. The only team I think that has scored more than their season average against Miami this year was Florida State, where they're averaging – well, it was less than their average at the time, but 
They only scored three points at Boston College. So now Florida State's averaging only 17 points a game and scored 20 against Miami. Every other team, Miami's held below their season average on points. Uh, you know, fourth in the nation or eighth in the nation by tackle for loss rate. Uh, same thing on sack rate. Obviously, the raw number is going to be a little bit lower because we played a lot, uh, one less game or two less games than a couple of the teams with more tackles for loss or sacks. But, yeah, I mean, that's going to be the – the key to the game is really going to be the defenses and see what the offenses can do when they have the opportunities to make plays and get scores. So, oh, excuse me, man. Um, but yeah, that's really going to be it. I think it's going to be a low scoring game. Uh, and you know, yeah, these teams both obviously want to beat each other, uh, you know, cause you have that conference rivalry thing. And then you also have the ACC coastal division championship basically on the line um, for Miami. If Miami beats Virginia tech and Georgia tech wins, or loses, Georgia Tech, uh, there's two things that have to happen. I think Georgia Tech has to lose again. But uh, if Georgia Tech loses and Miami beats Virginia Tech, then the ACC championship or Coastal Division championship is done at the end of the game on Saturday. Miami has won it and going to Charlotte for the first time since we joined the ACC. Um, so there is a way that Miami can win it this week. There is no way for them to outright lose it. But if Miami does lose to Virginia Tech, then obviously Virginia Tech is in the driver's seat for the rest of the season in that they would, you know, have had the uh, head -head tiebreaker and need to lose another game for Miami to pop up there. So, uh, yeah, you know, big stakes and, uh, you know, that are coming up uh, in this game. And I wrote it on the website today. I said, you know, the playoffs start now for Miami, you know, and we uh, began today's video talking about the rankings and things like that, which is good to talk about. But, at the you know, uh, in, in truth of fact, Miami's playoff, Journey starts now. And I know that, yeah, it's been all seven weeks, but, like, really now against George, oh, sorry, Virginia Tech and against Notre Dame, those are playoff games. So, you know, if Miami loses one, they're pretty much out because nobody's going to give Miami credit for any of the other wins, regardless of any statistics or narratives that you can say about Clemson uh, having lost to Syracuse the week before. So maybe they're playing a little bit better. doesn't matter. Syracuse, you're just supposed to beat, you know, beat them to sleep. Well, Clemson lost them. No, that doesn't matter. That's a good loss because it was on the road, whatever, whatever. You should have beat them by more. And it's going to be that kind of thing down the line for all the things. You thought Florida State was going to be a marquee game. Uh, it's a marquee win for Alabama, but it's a bad win. and. Uh, a bad win for Miami. You know, you think these other things, whatever. Uh, so, yeah, the playoffs for Miami start on Saturday, uh, and that's really it. So you got 8 o'clock game, uh, win that game. Hopefully you got an 8 o'clock game against Notre Dame, who's number three in the uh, college football playoff rankings right now of uh, the next week. And it just goes from there. So, yeah, uh, huge, huge developments upcoming, gigantic stakes for the season. Uh, so, you know, Miami has to bring it. And this is what uh, I've been waiting for as a fan and as a blogger and alumni of the university, uh, alumnus, excuse me, of the University of Miami, um, is to play games of consequence. And the games of consequence are here. So uh, we'll see what Miami can do. The Hokies bring that defense we talked about. Trayvon McMillan, the main running back, as he has been over the past couple of years, averaging just about four and a half yards per carry and two touchdowns. So nothing tremendous in the rushing attack for Virginia Tech. It all starts with Josh Jackson. 17 touchdowns, four picks, and he's also a factor on the ground and getting outside the pocket. So Miami Miami's defense, uh, certainly in the past game in particular, has its hands full uh, with the Hokies. And, uh, of course, uh, Miami trying to score and make the big plays you would think is going to be the formula again against the Virginia Tech defense that's most likely not going to give up 15 play drives uh, in this game. All right, Cam Underwood, State of the U, joining us to talk Miami football. We always enjoy the discussion as the uh, Canes take on Virginia Tech. And for the next two weeks, it's going to be a whole lot of fun with Virginia Tech for the quasi-coastal division championship this week and then Notre Dame coming up uh, with a game at Miami in two weeks. Uh, Cam, uh, love the discussion, the insight. It's fun from here on out, no doubt, and uh, we'll catch you soon. It'll continue to be fun as long as we win, but, you know, uh, in storm and sunshine, I'm here for the Miami Hurricanes. So uh, thanks for having me, and I'll see you guys soon.